Welcome back everyone. In this lecture, we will prove the Weyl's theorem for SL2, namely that any finite dimensional representation of SL2 is completely reducible. So, let us start with the finite dimensional representation V. Let V be a finite dimensional representation of SL2C. So, we have this Casimir operator. acting on capital V. So, that is given by C of V equal to x y V plus y x V plus of h square for all V in capital. So, we observed that this C actually commutes with the action of action of capital ok. This is something we already observed. Now, suppose if we take uh, V to be uh, this irreducible representation V of m ok. If V is equal to V of m where m comes from this z plus. So, then this C must be some scalar multiple ok this must be some scalar multiple of this V of m. Why? Because uh, C being an operator acting on capital V, C must have some eigenvalue call it lambda. So, lambda be an eigenvalue of C. So, then look at C minus lambda times identity on capital V. So, then the kernel of this is going to be non-zero space ok. Since this is a non-zero space inside capital V and this is you can easily check that this is SL2 sub module because C commits with the action of SL2 and lambda identity commits with the action of SL2. So, the difference will commit with the action of SL2. So, the kernel which is uh, like eigen space. Uh, corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda. So, that actually uh, will uh, will be SL2 sub module. So, that is easy to check. So, that forces that uh, V has to be equal to the kernel of C minus lambda times identity. And this argument can be generalized to any uh, algebra or any semi simple algebra and so on. So, this is called Schur's lemma ok. This is called Schur's lemma. Basically, what is Schur's lemma says? If you have an algebra and uh, finite dimensional irreducible representation of that algebra, and you have an operator acting on that, that that operator, let's say, commutes with the action of the algebra. So then, uh, that operator must be some scalar times identity if that representation is irreducible representation. So it is easy to prove the same proof that I we have given here works. So, in particularly uh, we can actually see what happens uh, explicitly to this lambda because this lambda can be determined using this explicit formula of this C. So, note that uh, this C being x y plus y x plus half time h square. So, we can pick V inside capital V being the highest weight vector, highest weight vector. Since V is equal to V of m, we know that H V will be m V and then X V will be 0. So, now let us use this formula to compute what is C V. So, C V is going to be X Y V plus Y X V. So, this is going to be 0 plus half times h of h v, but h v is m v. So, h square v will be m square v. So, now uh, you can see that this is exactly equal to x y v plus half times m square v. Now, note that x y is 
y x plus h. So, that means x y v is going to be y x v plus h v. Now, this is 0. So, that tells you that x y v is nothing but just m v. So, then we get m square by 2 plus m times v. So, c v is acting as this scalar m square by 2 plus m on this vector v. Now, since c acts as lambda on entire module that forces that this lambda is exactly m square by 2 plus m. So, this is the uh, constant that we are getting uh, using the action of c. Okay. So, basically c is m square by 2 plus m times identity on capital V when V is V of M. So, this is a interesting uh, calculation. So, now if we go back to finite dimensional representation uh, of capital V, we know that. Okay. So, if we take V to be finite dimensional representation of SL to C. So, now we know that uh, uh, for this uh, Casimir operator, okay, this actually uh, this V can be uh, decomposed into uh, direct sum of generalized eigenspaces. Okay. So, this C commutes with the action of SL to C. So, in particularly we can decompose V into direct sum of V theta, theta runs over C. So, this is the generalized eigenspace. Of course, corresponding to the eigenvalue theta for the operator C. So, now uh, we know that since C commutes with the action of SL to C, all this V theta they are all invariant under SL to C. So, V theta is indeed SL to sub module. Now, if you are interested in proving uh, complete reducibility for capital V, so it is enough to consider only V theta. Okay. So, we can without loss of generality assume that this C indeed acts as the scalar. So, the sorry the only Eigen value of C uh, for uh, on this uh, module V theta is just theta. Okay. So, basically it is being generalized Eigen space corresponding to the Eigen values theta. So, there would not be any other Eigen value that you can have for C on this space V theta. Okay. So, without loss of generality one can assume that v equal to v theta. So, that means c has only theta as eigenvalue on capital V. Okay. So, this assumption is reasonable because we already decomposed v into direct sum of uh, the sub module. So, we can restrict to this sub module. So, now uh, we already know that given any finite dimensional module, there is always uh, uh, irreducible sub module containing in that. So, let us take one such irreducible sub module, let us call it V m. So, V m let us say sits inside V. Okay. So, now uh, if we take uh, C restricted to this V m, so then this is going to be operator acting on V m. Okay. So, but we already know that C restricted to V m it is nothing but the scalar multiple of uh, identity. The scalar is also given by m square by 2 plus m identity on V of m. Okay. But we know that uh, already theta is the only Eigen value that we have on this uh, capital V. Now, m square by 2 plus m is becomes Eigen value for this uh, uh, operator C uh, on this capital V. So, that forces that this theta must be equal to m square by 2 plus m. 
okay so this is the conclusion that we get immediately as theta is the only eigen value for c restricted to capital so now uh, if we take uh, another let's say irreducible representation sitting inside capital v then by uh, earlier argument similar argument tells that that uh, theta must be exactly equal to n square by 2 plus n so that forces that this m square by 2 plus m should be equal to this n square by 2 plus n so now this is just a simple exercise if you have m and n non negative integers such that this n square by 2 plus n is same as m square by 2 plus m then that forces that m equal to n. So, this is something I leave it as exercise. So, this exercise tells you that uh, from this equation we get m equal to m. That means, if we take another copy of uh, irreducible representation sorry some other irreducible representation inside capital V that should be another copy of V of m. So, there is no other irreducible representation that can sit inside capital V. So, this means if V decomposes into irreducible representation then it can only decompose as direct sum of V of m nothing else. Okay. So, modulo the Weyl's theorem modulo the Weyl's theorem we can only have v equal to v of m direct sum some copies ok. So, this is what we should ultimately prove that v is isomorphic to direct sum of v of m. So, let us see how one can obtain that. So, for that uh, purpose we need to understand the operator h that is acting on this capital V ok. Here is the small lemma. So, I will leave all the calculation to you if v is a finite dimensional SL2 representation then we can actually look at the operator h which is acting on kernel x to kernel x ok where kernel x is nothing but those vector in capital V such that x v is killed. Note that uh, to actually prove that v is isomorphic to direct sum of v of m. So, we need to actually look for maximal vectors or highest weight vectors corresponding to the eigenvalue m. Okay. For that purpose, uh, if you are interested in looking for maximal vectors, let us look at the kernel of x and then restrict the operator h on that and then see what we can actually do there. Okay. So, so, what we have this h the operator when we restrict it to kernel x that is diagonalizable. As I said earlier we are expecting the operator h to act diagonalizably on entire v, but for time being just uh, we can prove that it is diagonalizable on kernel x and then later we will actually use this to prove it is going to act diagonalizably on, on entire uh, space. So, that is actually application of this theorem. Okay. So, we are proving the weaker version, but that is good enough. Okay. How one can prove this? First to note that uh, if I start with uh, some w inside kernel x, then x w will be 0, then h uh, x h w is going to be. So, h x minus x h is 2 x. So, x h will be h x minus 2 x. So, that means h x h w will be h x w minus 2 x w which will be 0 because x w is 0. So, this forces that x h w is 0 that means h w is again in the kernel of x. So, when you restrict h to kernel x then it defines some operator on kernel x to kernel x. So, that is easy exercise we have done it. So, now uh, we are going to actually uh, use some computation involving uh, this operator x and y. 
So, I will leave it to you to check. So, this is a simple exercise, one can do it by induction. So, if you uh, look at the operator x y power k which makes sense inside endomorphism of V. So, then you can prove that uh, x power y, y power k when you are trying to commute it, uh, then you can see that this is going to be exactly y x power k plus k into y power k minus 1 times h minus k plus 1 and this is true for all k greater than or equal to 1. Okay. So, this is something I will leave it as exercise. So, this can be proved uh, uh, using induction. So, now uh, one can easily see that uh, if we take uh, some vector w in kernel x, so then we have by actually repeated use of this, okay. so if we take x power k y power k v, then that is going to be exactly equal to k w k factorial time h into h minus 1 etcetera h minus k plus 1 w. And this is true for all k greater than or equal to 1. Okay. So, just uh, uh, take this uh, formula and then uh, just use this formula to actually prove uh, this formula. Okay. So, this is again simple formula one can prove using the induction. Okay. So, how one can actually uh, verify this? Uh, sorry, I will leave it, this is use induction to prove this. I will leave it to you to check this. So, how one can use this to immediately get that uh, H is indeed, indeed diagonalizable operator. So, now uh, go back to the our operator H which is defined from kernel x to kernel x. So, this formula tells you that x power k y power k w is given by this. Okay. So, suppose this h into h minus 1 etcetera h minus k plus 1 is 0 uh, for all w coming from kernel x for some k. So, then that tells you that h satisfies some uh, op polynomial which has distinct roots Those that will imply that h is diagonal. Okay. So, that is what we are going to say. So, basically kernel x uh, uh, being actually sub uh, subspace of this capital V and V is finite dimensional representation of SL to C. So, using this one can conclude that uh, this operator x must be nilpotent when you consider it as operator on capital V. So, look at the operator x, so that is defined on capital V. Okay. So, now we know that uh, H x is nothing but 2 x. Okay. So, with this conditions, uh, we can actually prove that. Okay. So, we leave it as exercise. Again, this is not very hard to prove. Prove that x is nilpotent. Actually, x acts nilpotently on capital V. Similarly, y also acts nilpotently on capital V. Maybe let me write very general version here. Suppose you have two operators, let us say E h inside some endomorphism of uh, some w. So, but such that E h is given by some C e for some C non-zero coming from the complex numbers. So, then one can prove that C is nilpotent. Okay. So, one can adjust this scalar C and then rescale h and then one can assume that without loss of generality. E h is exactly E. Okay. 
So, there is this trace criterion that one can use to prove that this E is nilpotent. So, note that what is trace criterion says, okay, recall. So, trace of E power k is 0 for all k greater than or equal to 1 if and only if E is nilpotent. As long as your space is finite dimensional, of course, the dimension of W is finite dimensional and if you work over uh, any field, it does not matter. The trace criterion says trace of E power k is 0 for all k that implies actually if and only if E is nilpotent. Okay. So, now using this, you can conclude immediately that trace of E is 0. Now, it is a simple calculation to show that any E power k will look like commutator of two things. Okay. So, that means trace of E power k is also 0. So, it is a very simple exercise uh, comes from linear algebra. So, I will leave it to you to check. So, that means uh, if we prove, uh, yeah, that means uh, this x itself acts nilpotently on capital V and y itself acts nilpotently on capital V. So, some power of x, some power of, power of y, especially dimension V gives you that uh, x power dimension V, y power dimension V is 0. So, now when you restrict nilpotent operator to any uh, invariant subspace that will be nilpotent. So, using that you can prove that uh, there exist n, there exist n in, in n such that x power n, y power n, w is 0 for all w in kernel x. Okay. So, that implies that using this formula this h, so k factorial we can forget h into h minus 1 etcetera h minus n plus 1 w is 0. So, h into h minus 1 etcetera h minus n plus 1 w is 0 for all w in kernel x. So, that means this operator h satisfies this polynomial. Uh, h into h minus 1 etcetera h minus n plus 1. So, this is identically 0 on kernel x. So, that means the minimal polynomial of h. So, the minimal polynomial of h restricted to kernel x. So, of some t. So, is going to divide t into t minus 1 etcetera t minus n plus 1. Since this polynomial has distinct roots not only distinct roots, they have all roots, uh, integral roots, okay, non-negative integers and distinct roots that forces that the minimal polynomial of this h restricted to also has distinct roots. So, since the minimal polynomial of h restricted to kernel x has distinct roots that forces that uh, h restricted to kernel x is indeed diagonalizable, h restricted to kernel x is diagonalizable. So, now we have a diagonalizable operator acting on this uh, uh, kernel x. So, now if you are interested in finding this copies of E of m, now it is easy to do. So, since uh, h restricted to kernel x is diagonalizable, we can actually take the Eigen basis. So, let us call v1 etcetera some v r. So, this is the Eigen basis of kernel x of course, with respect to the operator h. So, in particularly, so what will happen to this hvi? hvi is going to be some scalar. Okay. So, this scalar is going to be let us call it lambda i v i. Okay. So, then uh, x v i will become 0. Okay, but this will force that the submodule generated by V i inside capital V. So, this is actually irreducible submodule and which is isomorphic to V of lambda i. But we already know that the only irreducible uh, submodule that can can be embedded inside V is that V of m uh, for which that uh, m square by 2 plus m becomes eigenvalue of that cosmere operator c. 
So that forces that this lambda i must be m. Okay. So that means h v i must be m v i for all i and x v i is 0. So each v i indeed generates a copy of v m. Now the claim is v is indeed direct sum of this sub module generated by v i. Okay. Each one of them indeed copies of v m. So, we have exactly R copies of V m. So, V is written as direct sum of R copies of V m. So, how one can prove that? Let us let us take this uh, sum of V i, i ranging from 1 to R as some V dash. So, climb first climb is V equal to V dash. Okay. Suppose not then v will be strictly contained in v dash uh, will be strictly containing v dash that will force that v modulo v dash is a non zero space so now look at that operator c okay it's because c actually leaves v dash invariant v dash is sum of uh, sl2 sub modules so c leaves v dash invariant as v dash is a sum of SL2 sub modules. So, then that will imply that C leaves operator on induces operator on this quotient as well. Okay. So, since this is a finite dimensional representation, finite dimensional SL2 module, so this must have some irreducible representation sitting inside. So, there will be some irreducible module, but uh, note that c actually will act as scalar on that irreducible representation let us say w which is sitting inside v modulo v dash so this is irreducible which is isomorphic to let us say some v n so now uh, c is going to act as scalar okay when you restrict to, to v n so that is going to be n square by 2 divided by plus n into identity so now the only eigen value that uh, c can take on capital V is uh, m square by 2 plus m. Okay. But here we are saying that in the induced quotient we have another Eigen value. Okay. So, that forces that both Eigen values must be same. So, that will imply that uh, this n is, is also equal to m. Okay. So, there is nothing actually you get newly. So, you will be getting uh, this n equal to m. So, uh, now uh, if you go back to this uh, copy of this w, let us say it is generated by some v bar. So, then what we can do? We can see that h v bar will be m v bar and x v bar will be 0. Okay. But if you replace this v bar by some v plus some element coming from let us say w j where w j is coming from uh, this okay, what I denoted uh, this sub module generated by v j. Okay. So, then you can see that uh, so these are all coming from this uh, finite dimensional uh, representation of SL2 of C. So, indeed uh, if you carefully analyze uh, this irreducible representation which is isomorphic to Vm. So, for any vector that is there in Vm, there will be a largest power of x such that x power actually x power of that kwj that will be inside the kernel of x. So, that means uh, x power k plus 1 w j will be 0 okay, because it cannot keep increasing. So, by putting together all of them you can see that there exists some largest power k inside g plus such that x power k v okay, even for v. Okay, for v it is just uh, because v is coming from capital V, v being finite dimensional. 
So, x power sum, uh, uh, sum x power v will be 0. So, you can choose k such that x power k v is becoming element of kernel x. And then if you apply that same x power k on this uh, element that is also going to be there. inside uh, your model ok. So, let us go slowly. So, you have this uh, v bar which is written as v plus uh, some elements from that uh, sub module generated by v j. Now, it is easy to see that there exists k in z plus such that x power k v is in the kernel x. So, that is just comes from the fact that capital V is finite dimensional and x power k v going to increase actually uh, the eigen value because we can choose v such that okay, because this uh, w is uh, generated by v bar. So, v bar we want to write it as v plus something. So, we can choose this v coming from uh, this Eigen space corresponding to M. So, basically from Vm. So, Hv will become Mv. Okay. So, now because we can choose this from here, it is clear that x power kv will have Eigen value M plus 2k. Since they are all distinct, so there exists some k such that x power k plus 1v is 0. So, that way you can choose this k. So, now this x power k v if it is non zero then that tells you that m plus 2 k becomes eigen value ok eigen value for the operator h and this x power k v becomes highest weight vector, highest weight vector inside capital V. So, that implies that v of m plus 2 k will sit inside v, but that will that cannot happen because we already observed that for the only irreducible copy that can occur inside v is v of m. So, that forces that this k being 0. Okay. Now, if k is 0, so that means what? So, that means this x v is 0, that means v itself is actually highest weight vector that forces that v itself highest weight vector of weight m. That means, V has to be inside this summation V j. Actually, it is one of the, it is one of this uh, V j. Okay. So, V is exactly one of this V j. But anyway, uh, so that is not necessary. Actually, it, it does not need to be one of the V j. It is going to lie inside the top weight space of summation v j ok sum of the top weight space because it has weight m. So, it has to lie on the uh, sum of the top weight spaces which corresponds to m ok. So, now uh, you can see that uh, this v bar it is coming from actually the quotient. So, that forces that v bar is non zero inside the quotient, but we have proved that uh, v bar is zero because v is belonging to this uh, summation uh, v j sub module generated by v j. So, that gives the contradiction that v bar is non zero. So, this proves that v is exactly equal to summation v j j range from 1 to r. So, now uh, let us prove that uh, it is indeed uh, uh, direct sum. 
for that purpose if you take some non zero vector w w which is a non zero vector inside vj let's not call it vj sub module generated by vj intersection summation k not equal to j sub module generated by vk okay so then what will happen this being irreducible so this forces that the intersection vj intersection this summation vk k not equal to j this is an entire module vj okay so this is forced so now if you take this vj so this is now lies inside because this is there in this vj summation vk k not equal to j so this forces that this vj is sum of scalar multiple of scalar multiple of this vk k not equal to j which is contradiction because the weight of this is m so it has to lie on the top weight space which corresponds to m so that means this vj must be the sum of scalar multiple of vk k not equal to j which is contradiction to the fact that they are all linearly independent okay because we have chosen linearly independent vectors and then we have actually constructed the corresponding sub module generated by them so so this cannot happen so that forces that this must be direct sum so that proves that v must be direct sum of this vj range from 1 to r each one of them is copy of vm so basically we have r copies of this so basically it suggests some procedure to decompose capital v into direct sum of rsl2 irreducible representation so what is the procedure you take v first to write it as direct sum of v theta theta comes from c where this is the generalized eigen space corresponding to the eigen value theta for the operators c okay then you focus on v theta so look at the kernel x inside this v theta so take basis of this call it v1 etc vr so then this v theta is nothing but sub module generated by this vjs j range from 1 to 1 okay so basically this decomposition and choosing this basis gives you the decomposition of capital v into direct sum of all this uh, finite dimensional irreducible sub representations of capital v so this completes the proof of wiles theorem okay so this more or less actually completes uh, the representation theory of sl2 so we will actually see some consequences of uh, this uh, in the next class uh, so we also need to make uh, more observations about uh, finite dimensional representation of sl2 using the facts that we have already proved okay especially using this complete reducibility we can immediately uh, get uh, main, many information about the given finite dimensional representation okay i'll stop here uh, we will continue in the next class yeah thank you